as a religion, an unstable component. A thousand years ago, the Mutazilites tried to reform the religion. They were wiped out. The fact is that Islam is many things, many, many things. But to say it's a religion of peace is nonsense. It's to ignore reality. It's to ignore very difficult but necessary facts, not paradigms, but facts. To say that Islam is a religion of peace is to say something based entirely on hope. It's to elevate a hope into truth. And I hope, as you all know, history teaches us that's a very bad thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Today's video reveals the profound ideological rift between two perspectives on a critical global issue. The President Bush's claim of Islam as a religion of peace and the Times Square bombers' declaration of a war with Muslims. This juxtaposition underscores the complexity of Islam's role in modern conflicts, raising questions about its ideological alignment with Western values and its capacity for peaceful coexistence. The debate's objective is to explore whether Islam's fundamental principles align more with peace or with conflict, challenging us to confront our own beliefs about this influential religion. Let's dive into the video. If you look at a religion like Islam, on an intellectual level, it was expressed by the founder of Islam as a demolition of all other gods. Polytheism had to end. And all humanity had to be united under one God. From those of you who are familiar with history, and I think a crowd like this is, you know that no monotheistic religion can be a religion of peace. No monotheistic religion is a religion of peace. And definitely not Islam. Monotheistic religions know periods, lengthy periods of peace, but they also know lengthy periods of war. In terms of practice, yes, in Islam, you practice charity, you go to Hajj, you pray, all of that. But in terms of practice, there's also the expression, there's the concept of jihad. And I find it a pity that Ziba Khan did not mention that concept, which is central to Islam's conquests and Islam's success. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, in his lifetime, conducted 65 campaigns of war that were all successful. And that militaristic history of Islam is well documented. Just go Google it. And if you don't find it on Google, go to all those former empires that were conquered. Ayan Hirsi Ali's argument pointing out that Muhammad's mission to eradicate polytheism and unify humanity under one God was inherently aggressive. Let's not sugarcoat it. Monotheistic religions, Islam included, have never been purely peaceful. They've had their fair share of conflicts and wars alongside any peaceful periods. Sure, Islam preaches charity, pilgrimage and prayer, but that's only part of the picture. Hirsi Ali drags the often ignored concept of jihad into the spotlight, accusing Zakir Naik of conveniently glossing over this critical aspect. Jihad isn't a minor detail. It's central to understanding Islam's historical conquests and successes. Hirsi Ali isn't just spouting off opinions. She backs her claims with hard historical evidence, noting that Muhammad led 65 successful military campaigns. This isn't some footnote in history. It's a core part of Islam's legacy. Hirsi Ali challenges her audience to stop taking sanitized, watered down versions of history at face value. She urges them to dig into the records of empires conquered by Islamic forces and face the facts head on. Her message is blunt, do your research, confront the brutal truth, and understand the full scope of Islam's impact. You not have a debate about Islam and whether or not Islam is a religion of peace without talking about the facts to do with Islam. It's an absurd situation we're in, where nothing that anyone does whilst being Muslim is any responsibility of Islam's. Yet anything anyone does whilst being a Christian or a Jew is responsibility of all Christians, all Jews. Murray's point hits hard with its brutal honesty. To debate whether Islam is a religion of peace, we must include all relevant facts. Absolving Islam of responsibility for acts committed by its followers while holding Christianity and Judaism accountable is hypocritical and intellectually dishonest. Murray emphasizes the need to openly discuss jihad, central to Islamic history and doctrine. Ignoring Muhammad's 65 military campaigns, crucial to Islam's expansion, evades reality. 
this double standard isn't just annoying, it's harmful. By not scrutinizing Islam equally, we hinder genuine understanding and productive dialogue. Murray insists, we must judge religious actions consistently across all faiths to address real issues. Islam 1, 2 and 3. Islam 1, the Quran and the life of Muhammad uh, and the Hadith. Islam 2, the tradition of the Sharia. Islam 3, what Muslims do now. The first of those things, Islam, the Quran and so on, is bad. It is bad. There is a lot of violence in it. And what's worse, the peaceful verses are superseded by the violent verses. The violent verses also, sadly, are more numerous in number. Then you've got the life of Muhammad. Again, a bad man, a very bad man, it has to be said. Not a great role model, if you look at it. Uh, it takes child brides, abuses a small girl, uh, multiple wives, uh, himself a warrior, himself a war criminal, himself beheads uh, uh, Jews. Uh, this, I would have thought, would be a signal of not great peacefulness. Um, <laughs> Then you've got the tradition of the uh, Sharia. Again, not great peacefulness. Still, no schools of Sharia that people in this hall would want to submit to. And thirdly, what Muslims do now, thankfully, there is some hope in that one. Because most Muslims, thank goodness, I almost said thank God, but uh, <laughs> old habits die hard. Um, uh, most Muslims don't do what those texts say. Um, because they exercise their judgment as moral beings without having to refer to defunct holy books. Murray begins with Islam 1, the Qur'an, the life of Muhammad and the Hadith. He bluntly states that these texts are problematic, filled with violence, and disturbingly, the peaceful verses are often overshadowed by the more numerous violent ones. Muhammad himself, according to Murray, was far from an ideal role model. He cites Muhammad's marriage to a child bride, his multiple wives, his warrior status, and his war crimes, including the beheading of Jews, as clear indicators of his unsuitability as a figure of peace. Next, he addresses Islam to the tradition of Sharia. Here, Murray argues that Sharia law does not embody peace and would be unacceptable to anyone in his audience. The lack of peacefulness in Sharia, according to Murray, is evident and problematic. Finally, Murray turns to Islam 3, the actions of contemporary Muslims. He notes a glimmer of hope here, acknowledging that most Muslims today do not strictly follow these violent texts. They instead use their moral judgment, often ignoring the outdated and violent directives of their holy books. This deviation from strict adherence to Islamic texts, according to Murray, is a positive sign, indicating that most Muslims are more peaceful than their religion's foundational texts might suggest. What about Muslims you know who do not? adhere to a violent form of religion? Are they, if, the, if there's something about the faith themselves, are they embracing spiritually something that is morally an illusion? Well, my parents and uh, people like my respectful opponents here are ignoring the basic tenets of their religion. When Muhammad, the founder of the religion, called out to all Muslims, and that's how he won most of his wars, by saying, I have been ordered, and all believing men have been ordered to attack and kill and maim anyone unless they testify, unless all men testify to the fact that Allah is the one and only, Muhammad is his messenger. My father disobeys that. Um, well. Uh, Majid Nawaz tried to obey that first and then stopped obeying it. But the fact that that scripture is there and that history of militarism is there belies the motion that Islam is a religion of peace. The point I want to make is mm -hmm. Islam is a religion when you take the scripture that can be employed to wage war and Islam as a civilization has known periods of peace but you cannot if you pay attention to that history, pay attention to the evidence, continue to say that Islam is a religion of peace. No monotheistic religion is a religion of peace. No monotheistic religion is only a religion of war. It is both. But in Islam, and that's why we are debating right. it in the 21st century, there are more occurrences of violence and war and strife and subjection of women than there are in other religions. And my point, our point is, let's not deny it, because by denying it, we don't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Let's admit it, and then as intelligent people, take it from there. What is to blame on external factors? What is here. to blame to on the inside? Percy Ali's key message is that denying the violent aspects of Islam prevents us from solving the underlying issues. 
She urges us to confront these uncomfortable truths head on. By admitting the problematic aspects of Islam's scripture and history, we can begin to address the problems intelligently and constructively. Her blunt honesty is a call to action, challenging us to acknowledge the complexities of Islam and work towards solutions based on reality, not denial. Extremist Majid respond. So, um, I, forgive me for the assumption, Ayan. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with you, by the way, but forgive me for the assumption, but do you speak Arabic? Do you, do you have you studied Arabic grammar? And, and I, I, I'm asking for a purpose which, if you do uh, give me the chance to explain, I will. But, but first of all, just let me ask you that question. I don't speak it as well as you do. And I want oh, to I know, know what that, the, that. where the question is going before I give a full right. answer okay. to that. <laughs> you if you be, want me to quote you the may Quran, be surprised. I will. You may be surprised that I don't <laughs> know if I speak well or not. But the reason I'm asking is that you just quoted a hadith of the Prophet. And you actually really did exaggerate what he said. And, and I'll quote you the exact hadith in Arabic and then translate it. Now, what you quoted was, uh, well, the hadith is, Umirtu an uqatil an nasa hatta, Umirtu an uqatil an nasa hatta yashadu an la ilaha illallah. Now, what you quoted and in the translation was, kill and maim, and, and he went on and explained. Now, actually, uqatil means to fight. Now, I'm not saying that that's a good hadith. What I'm saying is when we're translating, let's try and be accurate. Uh, and that brings me to the point. And that is that I've just thought of a word to describe this, and it's just come to me, so thank you, because I'm going to use it forever onwards. And that word is suspended intelligence. There's a tendency when discussing Islam to suspend the tools that we have learnt and studied, that you have studied as well, that we use to analyse every other piece of scripture and literature in the world. And that is that we recognize that texts do not speak for themselves. We recognize that when we interpret scriptures and texts and books and poetry, that they are contextualized, that we have methodologies to approach them. When we're reading Shakespeare, when we're reading anything, we recognize that there's a way to interpret texts and there are schools of thought and differences over how to approach texts. Now, if we contextualize Martin Luther and say the Reformation was a good thing, Despite the fact that he said, kill and slay the peasants, where do you find them when they followed Thomas Munzer, when he was calling for not just breaking away from the papal authority, but also for rebelling against the monarchies and the dictators that they found themselves in? Martin Luther sided with the tyrants against Munzer and said, kill the peasants wherever you find them. Despite that, I'm prepared to say the Reformation was a good thing. And the reason I'm prepared to say that is that Martin Luther must not be judged by the standards of civilization that we, after an accumulation of thousands of years, have arrived at. He must be judged by the standards of civilization that were around during his time. And that's how society I, evolves. Yeah, and it, we recognize that for every other faith and for every other piece of literature, this yet when it comes to Islam, somehow we want to suspend Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray. what we've learned about that and quote verbatim from texts. Uh, yes, we read things in their context. I mean, you read we Chaucer don't. in context. Chaucer doesn't have followers. He doesn't have 1.4 billion people who believe everything. Sorry, I quoted or Martin Luther, believe, not Chaucer. Or are meant to believe everything that's I, I suppose Martin Luther does have followers. If you allowed me to speak, yeah. I'd address your Luther point. You'll, yeah. I'll get there, I promise. Right. Um, you don't. We, we don't. You don't have followers of Shakespeare who insist on, or are meant to be insist on, line by line, following everything Shakespeare did and believing everything he wrote. That's because it's literature. Actually, what's happening, Majid, is you're seeing, you've, point, you've put your finger on the problem. Absolutely. It's not us that isn't applying the rigorous critical faculties. We're applying them to the Quran as we would to any other work of literature. You're not because you can't. And and, and the final thing what, on that, if Majid, if Majid, what, what do you mean that if, he can't? He, well, because Maggi knows very well Majid that if he's... Majid is a believer. That and believers are not allowed to contextualize the Sorry, text. Can I, is that can, true? Can I bring you back to my question? What but, about wait, Martin is Luther? That, is that point really true? If you were, well, what, if, if you were allowed point, to contextualize, moment, you would say is, some of the things that right. Muhammad did is crap. If, if you would say uh, some of yeah. the things that Muhammad did is true that you cannot... So you contextualize. Is that true? No, it's not true. Now... Can I say? What do you think of Muhammad many... taking a six-year-old as a bride? What do you okay. think of that? I don't think that's a particularly good idea. However, <laughs> what I would say is that to hear it. there are many, many people in history that have done such a thing. And what we're talking about here is the failure to contextualize actions for the standards of their time. And I'll come back to the point I made, because Douglas, yeah. you didn't address it despite I'm your protestations that you were so. going to. Now let me just ask you again. Martin Luther was a fundamentalist, yes. wasn't he? Absolutely. All Christians now, would agree me, with you that he was right. a fundamentalist. Can I now answer my question? Please. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then right. I want to bring it okay. over. If there were currently Lutherans, there are Lutherans around, you meet them occasionally in Scandinavia and so on, very nice, <laughs> very nice it is, and peaceable guys they are by and large. If, however, 
there was a large proportion of Lutherans somewhere in Scandinavia that started blowing up non-Lutherans, or no, sorry, let's be absolutely right, started massacring peasants. Do you think the people would say, hang on a minute, let's not criticise Martin Luther. He did that by the standards of his time. We shouldn't criticise his followers all that much. We shouldn't point out what he said. So, no, we just say, you know, don't go and massacre peasants. Full stop. It was rubbish at Douglas, the time. It's rubbish the now. It's the same with you're the Quran. You're missing the point. If you're failing to judge... <laughs> no, let me yeah. bring in your point. Sure. Sure.